one o'clock. The Judiciary Committee is called to order. And I open up the hearing on House Bill 1192 relative to forfeiture of seized personal property and recognize the prime sponsor. Thank you, Madam Chairman. <clears throat> Thank you, committee members, for allowing me to introduce HB 1192 FN. This is a uh, bill that uh, fixes uh, one of our pieces of uh, civil asset, asset forfeiture, or is now criminal asset forfeiture in the state. And it also is a repeat of uh, a bill from uh, previous term, uh, HB 614. So for the new folks who aren't familiar with uh, asset forfeiture, or may not be, um, there's two varieties of asset forfeiture. There's civil and there's criminal. And the big difference between the two is due process rights that are, are much more uh, enhanced in uh, criminal asset forfeiture and the burden of proof. Um, on the civil side, it's, um, it's much easier to take a person's property um, and possibly wrongfully. So um, that's the, the big picture of asset forfeiture as far as criminal and civil goes. <clears throat> the other thing that's really hard, it took a little while for me to wrap my head around, is seizure and forfeiture. Seizure, uh, law enforcement may have a warrant or they may um, find something and get uh, some sort of contraband. And they take that item, certainly if it's uh, contraband drugs, um, that seizure is, is um, just authorized by law. Uh, or if there's a warrant, there's a possible <coughs> search for some specific items that are to be uh, seized. When the property is seized, it's taken into the possession of the uh, law enforcement agency that who have the warrant, uh, most likely. And, Professionals can straighten me out if I wander off of the straight and narrow. Um, so that's the, the seizure process. Forfeiture is a process that goes through the courts where the actual ownership of an item is transferred to the state, to the law enforcement unit, or perhaps um, other party that might claim ownership. So, seizure is more of a law enforcement thing backed up by a court order, and forfeiture is a court process which moves the ownership to another party. So, just keep those in mind while we're wandering through this. So, in 2016, um, with a lot of hard work by the Honorable uh, McGuire and Representative Birch, uh, New Hampshire uh, corrected what most people consider the problem of civil asset forfeiture in making it uh, a criminal process in the state. And that's a great thing. And so um, one of the parts of the bill, the first part of the bill, addresses a little tightening of the language. Um, pretty soon after the law was signed into into law by uh, Governor Hassan, um, there were tests to the edges of it. Um, a mailing on the 59th day, which arrived at the court on the 61st day, causing questions. And the other issue is uh, filing for the forfeiture, which is a, a court process that's going to go forward in the, in the future. Uh, filing, filing for the forfeiture, but not making any criminal charge, which left the asset seized and in limbo um, to be determined at some later date. There could be no end to that if, if there was no um, criminal charge brought. So that's what the first part of the bill is addressing, the, the idea of um, putting forward the uh, motion for forfeiture <coughs> and then also backing that with the criminal charge.
So that's first part. Second part is the um, reiteration of S HB uh, 614. And if that bill addresses uh, the other side of one of these problems, which is uh, another path for civil asset forfeiture, which goes to the federal government through a process called equitable sharing. So in this case, the seized item is what they call adopted to the federal government, given to the federal government. And this is done um, for, I think, you know, primarily uh, financial motives. This is uh, a process where the federal government, when they prosecute the civil asset forfeiture, will keep 20% of the asset or money taken and return 80% to the law enforcement unit that made the forfeiture. The state criminal asset forfeiture procedure provides 45% to the local law enforcement agency, 45% to the Attorney General's Drug Forfeiture Fund, and 10% to DHHS for various treatment possibilities. So for law enforcement, there's a very large incentive to adopt out um, forfeitures to the federal government. What this bill does in the second part is set a limit on what can be adopted out to the federal equitable sharing program. And it says that in order to use the federal program, you have to have $100,000 in U.S. currency. Other than that, it needs to go through the state criminal process, which provides the protections of stronger due process and uh, burden of proof uh, for that criminal forfeiture. Um, so in addition, I do have a, a minor amendment that uh, I've passed out, um, 2020-0411H, and it just uh, addresses some of the language tightening up that first part that we talked about on the existing criminal asset forfeiture. And uh, I think my lawyer behind me will uh, back me up on some of the details of that. So that's the overview. Um, I'm happy to answer questions. Thank you very much, Representative. Are there any questions for our colleagues? Yeah. Yes, uh, Representative Welfare has yeah, a so, question. So is it <coughs> ready? What I think I'm hearing you say is that this language says, just basically tightens up the law. Uh, except for the part that, that limits what can be done and go through equitable sharing. So it's two sections. The first part, which is uh, number one and two, is the tightening of the criminal forfeiture statute. Uh, part three and four are the $100,000 equitable sharing uh, portion. Any other questions? If not, thank you very much. The chair of the recognizes Sean Long, representing the Department of Justice, informational only. Good afternoon. Good, good afternoon. It's not morning anymore. No. Good afternoon, Madam <laughs> Chair. Uh, my name is Sean Locke. I'm a Assistant Attorney General of the Department of Justice. I'll forgo my background. You all know me. <laughs> Uh, the department. So we are taking an informational position, and we're really looking to highlight some of the information we provided in our fiscal note. So in preparation for this hearing, I asked our drug unit, which is comprised of four attorneys. Those four attorneys handle all of our asset forfeiture cases, along with our drug investigations and prosecutions, and they provide assistance to our homicide attorneys. And there's a paralegal with them as well. For the data over the past few years of how many forfeiture proceedings the unit had commenced, as well as um, how much, how many funds had been forfeited in the proceeding? Um, yes, sorry. Um, I uh, 
we not have a new fiscal note? No, so this was the, the fiscal note on the original bill. This study that wasn't with that fiscal note. So this is just to kind of provide additional information beyond the fiscal note. I, okay, thank you. Yes. I don't have anything on it. Right, right. No, that wasn't okay, put yeah, into the sure not Right, it. because, so we, so at, we get to the end. We don't know how much funding necessarily gets forfeited through this federal okay. equitable sharing. I just want to highlight what our unit already has to kind of show what okay. our four attorneys are doing and go from there. Thank you. So, and just so by way of kind of boring, these are calendar year numbers, which differs from an earlier bill related to the drug forfeiture fund where numbers were provided based on the fiscal year. Uh, so in 2016, the unit initiated 86 forfeiture proceedings and recovered and forfeited about just under $329,955.95. And I can follow up with an email with these numbers if that's easier so you don't have to all write them down. Um, in 2017, the unit initiated 106 forfeiture proceedings and $455,929.57 was forfeited. In 2018, 77 cases and $191,495.45 were forfeited, but that's as of yesterday. There are still proceedings kind of pending based on underlying criminal convictions having not been fully resolved, or criminal cases having not been fully resolved. And in 2019, the unit initiated 69 cases and 45,000, as of this date, $45,129.20 has been forfeited. Again, there are still pending cases that will lead to the resolution and that number will probably go up. We do not, and these are, we only handle cash only forfeitures. We do not forfeit in our drug cases, real or personal property. So we don't forfeit cars, we don't forfeit houses. Uh, and the federal government is a little more willing to do those types of forfeitures. And I, we do not track the cases that go to federal court or go under federal forfeiture proceedings. We're not necessarily even aware of when they're happening or when they've been initiated. <laughs> However, it is our understanding that there are police departments that fund substantial portions of their drug interdiction efforts with federal funds. And so the department anticipates that this could be this shift, this would be a shift of all of those cases under, or a large number of those cases under federal forfeiture law to the Department of Justice having to forfeit those funds. And that would, we anticipated to a substantial <coughs> increase in demands for our drug unit attorneys to initiate forfeiture cases and initiate forfeiture proceedings. Um, and that's the information I'm here to provide. Thank you, Bertrand, can you touch the question? <coughs> you lost me. Yeah. This 114 and whatever and 69 cases, those were both? So no, this is and state? no. This is all just state forfeiture. So what our drug unit has initiated, we have. I have no data with respect to how many cases end up in federal court. So you don't know in sixteen how much money you got back from? We know in sixteen we were got from our state eighty six state cases that we initiated. And what did you get back from the feds? I said that it's three hundred twenty-nine thousand nine hundred fifty-five. We don't we don't get money back from the feds. The our department is like the, the the police departments that work with them do. The Department of Justice. Do you get no funds? You get well, we no get funds from these granite panels or whatever. Not that I am aware of, and I can double check that and make sure of that. But I'm not aware that we receive funds from those unless they go through. We get funds through our forfeiture proceedings based you know, that we've described earlier. I'm not aware of that. I will double check that because I don't want to give you this information, but I am not aware that we do. And I'll double I'll make a note so I'll follow up with further information. Thank you, Representative Burke. Thank you. Uh, I'd like to clarify uh, what you said at the tail part of your, your testimony, talking about the shift of cases from the feds <coughs> to the state yes. uh, under this legislation. <coughs> if, if I think of three different buckets, completely state cases, this bill has nothing to do with, completely fed cases, this bill has nothing to do with, and, and cases that are joined or, or mixed in some, which this does. Uh, do you have information about how many of those cases, percentage-wise, let's say, where the forfeitable property is already in the hands <coughs> of the federal government, such that the federal government can proceed anyway, irrespective of our uh, uh, legislation. 
I am not, I don't, we don't have that information. I can look and see in terms of if there are cases we were involved in where we might have that information, but if we weren't, if our drug task force or our office was not involved in the underlying investigation, we may not have that data available. If, if we presume that in a joint state and fed uh, investigation that the feds are more likely to land up with the, uh, the, the forfeitable property, mm -hmm. um, why do you think that necessarily uh, large, the feds are just going to turn over you know, large amounts for the state to seek action. And some of that's going to depend on who's involved in the particular efforts here. I mean, there may be intergovernmental task force where the state agents are the ones who are actually seizing the property. And so if they're the ones, they have the property here. And if I'm reading this correctly, they would not be allowed to turn that over to the federal government for them to basically take control of the forfeiture right. proceeding. And so it, it really is going to depend on the relationships here that are described. That's why I said, I don't have exact data on all of this. It's just I wanted to highlight the fact that this could have lead to an increase in the workload for our drug community. Thank you. Uh, I could just increase yep. in the workload. What about increase in the revenue? Or decrease in the revenue? I, presumably, if there are more forfeiture cases that we're pursuing, this would likely lead to an increase in the amount that is forfeited. So, but. <coughs> our funds, our drug forfeiture funds, don't fund our unit. Um, I know we've had conversations and other pieces of legislation that those go to, I think, prim primarily go to the, our drug task force for their drug interdiction efforts. All right, thank you. Um, any other questions? Thank you very much. Oh, wait, Representative Parkin, any questions? Yes, you're asking about the numbers, the amount of money going to our agency here to answer from federal forfeiture money. Is that uh, is that information that your counterparts in the federal gov government would, would be able to provide, or is that something that? It's something I can inquire with them about. I don't know how they track kind of how money gets forfeited in the sense of if there's a list of number of cases, the way we track it, but I can certainly inquire with them and try to get that information to you. We would appreciate it yeah. if you could do that yeah. and get that back to the community. Mm -hmm. Thank you very much. Any other questions? If not, thank you for your time. And the chair uh, recognizes Stan McGuire. Glad to have you here. Thank you, Madam Chair, members of the committee. For the record, my name is Dan McGuire. I'm from Epsom. Um, as Representative Sylvia said, uh, in 2016, I was a state representative and sponsored the bill that uh, was talked about here to reform uh, civil asset forfeiture and criminal asset forfeiture. And we did that together with uh, Representative Birch and, and other members of this committee. And so it's now the policy of the state of New Hampshire that there be criminal convictions prior to forfeiture, right? That, that, um, and, and so what this bill does is um, make that apply to more cases, basically, not just state cases as it does now, but, um, but makes that policy true essentially prevents some cases from go, going to federal court where that is not the case, where there can be simple civil forfeiture without, without criminal conviction. Um, and so this was a good policy to put in four years ago, and I think it should be followed in more cases. I mean, it's not, it's not that complicated. Um, and, and the reason is that forfeiture by itself, without criminal conviction, that's not good public policy. Right? Because um, either the owner of the property in question is a criminal or they're not. Right? If they're not a criminal, then it's wrong to uh, drag them into court, get, you know, give them a giant expenses and time and so on, deprive them of their property. Um, but if they are a criminal, they should go to jail. Right? If we simply take criminals and take their property away, but don't send them to jail, uh, then we wouldn't be doing our job to protect the public from their crimes. Right? Part of the reason we have prison is to, for punishment, obviously, for the criminals. But the other reason is to protect the public. Because, because presumably, somebody's in prison, 
they're not preying on the public <coughs> with their criminal activity. But if you leave, if if, if your whole uh, uh, operation is simply to um, take their property away but leave them out on the street, what are they going to do? They're going to commit more crimes, and the public is going to be hurt that much more, right? So uh, we really ought to take the incentive away um, for just forfeiture and, and, and make sure that the system convicts people who deserve to be convicted. Thank you very much, ma'am. Other questions? Yes, Representative Burrow. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, this may be a very dumb question. I'm not familiar with forfeiture. And these, if somebody's been convicted, do, do the assets have to directly relate to the crime? Let's say somebody has a legitimate job and a bank account, and they, they, they're also a drug dealer. Do all the assets get seized? <laughs> yeah, that, thank you for the question. But um, I'm not an attorney, so I'm, I'm not sure I could answer uh, definitively. In theory, it's, it's, it's assets that are, that are related to the crime. But there have been cases where you know, somebody borrows their mother's car and drives to the drug deal, and and then the car gets taken away. Uh, there was a case in Massachusetts where someone owned a motel, and over the years there were occasional criminal uh, arrests made in the motel, just like any other place, and the police seized the entire motel. You know, things like that. Yeah. So it can be a sort of a gray area. Okay, thank you. <laughs> You know, when they say it's not the money, you know, <laughs> it's the money. Um, is it not possible that there are cases where um, the government wants the money and really doesn't, and I'm using money as a generic term, um, doesn't really care so much about um, uh, incarceration or the effort perhaps to reform someone um, or to punish someone, that it's just a way to get some revenue? Um, yes, thank you for the question. I think, I certainly think that's possible and, and the point of this legislation is to make that less likely, right? And to, um, to move the incentives around so that so that um, criminal convictions are are required. That's important. Thank you. Any other questions? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It it seems the way the the way way it's would be now written, it indicates that uh, taking the property confiscating the property or seizing the property would only be allowed if, in fact, there is a conviction. Uh, oh, thank you for the question. No, um, seizure and forfeiture are separate things. Seizure can occur immediately and without a conviction, you know, because that, that happens, essentially it's like an arrest, sort of, right? The, the stuff is there, it gets seized. But forfeiture is the transfer of the ownership, the title of the property, from the owner to the state and that's that happens that would have that would require conviction first an associated crime right it was conviction and then you proceed to the forfeiture and, and that gets to really to my question okay. the, the question is just that many cases criminal cases may be resolved even though a person is guilty without necessarily having a conviction. For example, drug case. Yeah. A person essentially acknowledges that they're guilty, mm -hmm. but goes through a program, and if they complete the program, then that conviction is not put into place. So in order for this to take place, in that particular circumstance, there would be no, there could be no fault. Yes, thank you for the question. I'm not sure I'm the best person to ask this of. This sounds like an, a question for an attorney as to what exactly is the legal meaning of this word or that word, et cetera. So um, I think you will be hearing from an attorney. He may be able to answer that better than I can. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? 
Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, Madam Chair. My name is Jared Bedrick. Uh, I am the attorney that I believe is the one that's going to be asked the questions that one can answer. So, uh, so I, I'm, a, I'm a lawyer at Douglas Leonard Garvey. Uh, I've been doing criminal defense for a number of years, but also do civil rights and other types of uh, uh, government interaction type litigation in the civil realm. I have had a handful of these cases that uh, go from cases with a criminal conviction, cases without a criminal conviction, cases with charges, cases with no charges, things like that, uh, handled federal and uh, state forfeiture actions. And so uh, my real purpose in being here, I, I have a little bit of um, an obligation, I suppose. So I, I had a case where uh, very recently my, my client was renting a room to his friend who was a parolee. <coughs> and it was discovered that that parolee was engaging in criminal sales of narcotics. So my client's house is, is raided and, and fully checked out and they find uh, you know, some uh, indications that the person, the parolee, his friend, was uh, dealing drugs. They also find my client's cash in a separate safe, so they instituted a forfeiture action against that cash uh, without ever charging my client with any crimes. And so when I was discussing it uh, for a different reason with uh, the ACLU staff attorney at Joe um he said, well, that, that's not possible. In 2016, we changed that. I said, no, 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 uh, because the law as it stands says that if the government goes for a conviction and loses and it results in a not guilty verdict, then they can't do it. But if they uh, abort the effort or they don't try altogether, then there's nothing barring them from proceeding with a purely civil forfeiture action. Uh, so I had suggested some language to him that might remedy that loophole, uh, as I understood the 2016 legislation to cover this problem already. So now I'm here to answer questions on, on that portion of the bill. The, the equitable sharing part, uh, I, I don't really have a horse in that race, so I'm, I'll abstain from uh, commenting on it. But at least for the, the initial part, I'm happy to answer any questions. Rep. Representative Chase. Thank you. Chair, thanks for taking my question. I'm lost. But, um, just going to be honest about it, but what I do want to know, all right, so a forfeiture is something that is done with a court order of property. So when does, when would that happen? Like, um, who would file that order to the court to be able to go in and have that, if the, yeah, the money forfeited? So as it stands right now, let's say we're dealing with $25,000. Mm -hmm. uh, if, if the state or any uh, police force in the state comes across, across that in a criminal investigation and uh, decides that they have enough evidence to suggest that that was the proceeds of drug sales or anything involved in a crime, they are required so that they can take that money right away. And they're required within, uh, well, they're required to send a letter to the owner of the property, or the person that they received the owner of the property, uh, telling them that they are seizing it, they intend to forfeit it, and give them instructions on, on how to contest that. And then within 60 days, they're supposed to file a petition in the court, just like any other civil lawsuit. But the lawsuit is against the money. It's a strange thing. That's why you'll see the cases are named State of New Hampshire versus 25,000 um, bucks. And then the, the normal civil process takes place just the same way it would in a car accident or something like that. There is one strange aspect of, of this procedure, which is that uh, the way it's written, as long as there's no criminal case attached to it, uh, the statute doesn't allow you to ask for a jury trial the same way that you would in, in a car accident case or anything like that. If the value's high enough to get a jur jury trial, but this wouldn't allow you to get a jury trial. The only way you can get a jury trial is to ask the court to interpret uh, a provision of Hampshire Constitution and harmonize it with a law from 1776, and it was uh, an expensive process for my client to do that, but um, 
uh, th there are a bunch of features where it, 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 it's a little bit different than a simple case, a normal simple case, but it ends up being you know, just a regular simple case. Can we follow up? Real quick follow up. Okay, so a jury trial, that would be because the person saying, you took my money and it doesn't belong to you? Right, so the, the government would be responsible for proving that it's more likely than not that that, uh, that sum of money or property, theoretically, uh, was the proceeds or related somehow to a criminal act, uh, here, some kind of drug-related activity, uh, and that forfeiting it wouldn't be, you know, wildly excessive compared to the type of drug, the type of criminal activity that was involved. Thank you. Thank you. I think um, Representative Gordon had a question earlier about drug court or you know a plea yes. agreement or things like that. So uh, there's an amendment. Well, there's there's language in there that should cover that. Uh, and there's a, been an amendment to make it a little bit clearer too. Is that, the, is that the amendment 04118 or yes. a different one? Okay. Correct. Uh, which, which has the reference to RSA 6171A, where uh, in, in that 6171A, which is the, the criminal forfeiture statute, if there is uh, some agreement that is made for the forfeiture of the disposition of the assets, um, then you know, if there's a plea agreement of some kind, then nothing prohibits them from moving forward and actually forfeiting the property. So, if, if theoretically, if there's a, if I'm the county attorney and I'm prosecuting a case where it's likely that the person is going to go into drug court, but I understand that this person's criminal activity led to, uh, you know, the procurement of, of some asset or some sum of money. If you can just put in the agreement that says, well, I'll give you a drug court, but you got to forfeit or you got to not contest the forfeiture of, of this property. And that, it, and that wouldn't be barred um, by anything that this bill does. Thank you, Madam Chair. Uh, thank you for taking my question. So the, just to be clear, the petition that you have to file within 60 days, is that uh, the petition of forfeiture or is that the actual charges, the criminal charges? So thank you for the question. That's that's the petition that's currently uh, in place right now. That's in, under current law. That's the civil lawsuit, the okay. forfeiture petition. The the um, the only thing this changes is that within 30 days of the hearing to determine, you know, the, the actual trial, uh, the state has to alert the court that you know, this relates to such and such other criminal actions. Because what happens is when they file that petition, that civil lawsuit, it'll be given a number. It'll have a court code, it'll have the year it was filed, and it'll say CV, meaning that it, it's placed on the civil docket. So it, it might be that no one ever catches which criminal case, which is given a CR number, uh, it is it's supposed to be in relation to. So the government just has to tell the court and, and the, the uh, respondent that it's, it's related to, you know, 2011 CR 111, and that just gives them, that just allows them to connect the criminal case to the civil case, so they can tell, you know, that, that there was a case, whether it had been, uh, you know, finding them not guilty or reported some reason or something like that. Okay, thank you. So just a quick follow-up. So if you, you, you do the petition, and then let, let's say it's a very complex case, so you don't charge for quite some time. How, how does that play out? I mean, so let's say I don't charge for nine months. Um, as long as I file the, 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 the petition within the 60 days, then that, those assets can still be held? Or I guess when, when does the clock end on when you can charge? Well, the, the clock ends on when you can charge when you decide to go forward with the forfeiture action. So. Um, to answer your question more clearly, and, and trying to be as less of a lawyer, I'm going to do it. Uh, when you, under current law, they'll file the petition within the 60 days, and they're allowed to ask the court to put a stay on the case, to stop the proceedings, pause it. Right. And presumably it's because, you know, we have an ongoing investigation or whatever it is. Um, that can last as, as long as, you know, as long as it takes to finish the investigation. And there really is no timeline. And, you know, 
Uh, that, that's a whole separate policy that might get addressed in future le legislation, but that doesn't really get touched in this legislation. This legislation just says, if you go forward with it, and you're about to take the person's money away, 30 days before that trial, okay. you, you basically, the, the state says, you know, judge, we're going to unpause it, and we're actually going to try <coughs> to take this money away. Well, 30 days before you do that, you know, just, just let the judge know which criminal action uh, you know, relates to this uh, sum of money. Okay. Any, any other questions? <coughs> uh, yes, Representative Miley. Thank you, Madam Chair, for taking my question, and thank you for taking my question. I apologize if this might have been covered when I was out of the room, but on line 18, it says, um, the conviction or agreement of the parties is not possible due to death or incompetence. How is that incompetence determined? So thank you for the question. The, the incompetence would be done in the, in the criminal part of the case. Uh, incompetence is raised by the defense in the first instance. So the defense says, you know, the defense attorney presumably says, my client is uh, not fit to stand trial. And then that triggers a process where uh, the Department of Corrections has a forensic examiner that, that will do a forensic examination of the defendant's mental state and determine if that person can, can you know, actually sit and have a trial. And if that person is not able constitutionally to, to understand the proceedings, uh, they, they really stop them until they either can be restored or they completely stop them if they can't be restored. And so that, that language is there in, in that event, if the state is prevented by you know, some reason uh, not of its own doing, if it, it can't get that conviction, then it's okay, you can continue with the forfeiture anyway. Thank you. Um, there are no more questions. Uh, thank you, you very much. Thank you. Excuse me, please. Um, the chair um, recognizes um, Robert Kay, representing the National Police Department. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. And welcome back. Thank you. <laughs> uh, Madam Chair, members of the committee, thank you for allowing me to speak today. Uh, my name is Rob Page. I'm a lieutenant with the National Police Department. I've been a police officer for 20 years and I'm currently the Divisional Supervisor of our Narcotics Intelligence Division, um, basically our drug unit. Um, I'm the Divisional <coughs> Supervisor, I, was, I spent about five years as an undercover uh, detective in our drug unit. I've been working my way through the ranks as a unit supervisor, and now I'm a Divisional Supervisor overseeing all drug investigations. I'm here to speak in opposition of House Bill 1192 <coughs> on behalf of the National Police Department. Um, as many of you may already know, it takes several thousand dollars to run a drug unit. The salaries of the police officers is paid for by the city. It's, it's accounted for in the city budget and it's paid by the city. However, all operational expenses for our drug unit and many other drug units to include Manchester Police Department, which I confirmed, is paid for through our drug forfeiture fund. To give you an idea of what it costs, uh, I took a look, I sat down with our financial director who um, showed me the books. In fiscal year 2019, it was approximately $97,000 operationally to run our drug unit. So that, every penny of that came out of drug forfeiture. And I can tell you that none of that is paying salaries, none of that is paying overtime. That's to pay for things like money to buy drugs, vehicles, cell phones, um, training for these, for these officers. It's a very dangerous job, as I'm sure you can imagine, as well as off-sites, um, apartments, office space for these gentlemen to work because they can't come to the police station every day because they're undercover. But it's not just the drug unit that forfeiture funds goes to. We also use it to donate to community-based programs. I can tell you specifically in 2019, we gave to the Child Advocacy <coughs> Center, as well as the National Youth Council, and the Chris Heron Project. Chris Heron Project specifically is a former professional basketball player who played for the Celtics, who comes to our high schools. And he's a former addict and um, has, has got his life in order and, and is, is doing fantastic. And he speaks to the, all the students at the high schools uh, about addiction and recovery and um, prevention. And, and we fund that through drug forfeiture. So the, the part of the bill that I'm, I'm addressing today specifically would be the stipulation about having a, an additional seizure of $100,000 in U.S. currency there in order for us to take 
uh, seized property through the federal government in the, in the federal forfeiture system. Um, that would impact us very, very on a very high scale, and I'll explain a little bit further. We have two ways that we, we get funds in our drug forfeiture. It's through the state and through the federal government. When we take a, a seizure through the state, we receive a 45% return on whatever is forfeited. If we take it through the federal government, we receive an 80% return on whatever is forfeited. So you can imagine any property that's liquidated through forfeiture, there's a 35% difference on the money that's going to come to us. And that is very significant. I can also tell you on that $100,000 note that less than 5% of all of our seizures in the past five years have amounted to $100,000 cash seizure. There are several seizures. They are all well, well, well below $100,000. And then even in the few cases where there may have been $100,000 that was seized, it's on a bigger scale and there are several other agencies that are involved, usually five to 10 other agencies, and all of those other agencies get a piece of that money and the amount that comes to Nashua is much less than $100,000. Um, finally, I'll just say that, again, we're, we're speaking about uh, getting money that comes to us as a result of federal forfeiture. Federal forfeitures make up about 75% of our current um, drug forfeiture fund in Nashua. So limiting, limiting our ability to, to get these funds and sustain this fund is going to cripple our ability to continue to operate at a high level and a safe level for our drug, uh, our drug unit. And at a time where there's an opioid epidemic, in the past three years in Nashua, we've had 117 lives taken as a result of op opioid uh, overdoses. I feel we need to increase efforts in uh, drug enforcement, not decrease. And I feel that this could be very dangerous for our community. Thank you for calling me here. Thank you very much for your testimony. Um, uh, question. Thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you for taking my question. To, to, to clarify what I think I heard you say, you said roughly 95% of the actual forfeitures are among state organizations and covered by state law already, but 75% of the money that you get comes from the federal government? No, no. Mm. No, so we spoke, I spoke about the stipulation in the bill being that there has to be an additional $100,000 U.S. currency seized in order to take any property to the federal forfeiture system. And so now I'm speaking to that of how many seizures we have at that level and why this would affect us so much. We have 95% of our seizures are less than $100,000. So 95% of our seizures would automatically be taken out of the run of of uh, going through the federal forfeiture system when we're talking about property. The 75% is speaking to, if you look at our total uh, balance right now for our drug forfeiture fund, 75% of that balance is as a result of funds received through the federal forfeiture process. So, so just for my own clarification, I think I understand what you're saying. <coughs> the money you have, 75%, let me put it differently. How much of that federal money would be lost? Thousands. At least 35, look, look at it this way. Anything that we get, oh, we're now going to be required to go through the state. It's the 80-45 thing. That's it's the 80, so 80-20 with the federal government, 45-45-10 with the state. So you're looking at at least 35% of those liquidations that we're losing. And as I said, it costs almost $100,000. And we don't spend carelessly. And uh, again, none of that money is to pay overtime or salaries. It's for equipment, cars, money for drugs, and facilities. Are there any other questions? Representative Hall. Thank you, Madam Chair. Um, you're pretty articulate, gentlemen here. So let me ask you a philosophical question. Why shouldn't drug whatever, bus or whatever, be a normal part of police work. Just like stopping cars with DWIs or chasing that dog that just bit the little kid or any of that. And, and any funds you get go into the general fund. I don't, what, well, what's the purpose of separating them out? Well, my opinion was drug enforcement is very specialized. So day-to-day -day operations, you put on a uniform, right? And you got a badge on, everybody knows who you are, you're in a car, you're, we have a duty to our, to our citizens and our, and our public and our community to do the everyday things that are required of a police officer. 
When you do undercover, and this is what we're talking about, undercover drug operations, we're talking about taking on an identity that is, is not the best. Um, I can tell you I did it uh, for several years. It's not, you know, you're drawing out your hair, you're, you're wearing different clothes. It's not the clothes, it's not the stuff that you typically be doing with your family. But it's a role that these gentlemen and ladies take on on a daily basis because they care and they're passionate about the work that they do. And it's very specialized, it's very dangerous, it's very specialized. And to have specialized enforcement, <coughs> it requires specialized equipment. You can't, you can't run a drug unit out of your police department. You can't, you can't buy drugs. I can't drive up in a cruiser and say, hey, I want a bag of dope. It's not going to happen. Um, so it, it requires special vehicles. Um, I, can't use, I can't use a work phone when it pops up City of Nashville and I say, I need a 50 a crack. They're, they're not gonna sell that to me. And so these are the types of things that it requires additional money that we can't expect the city and the budget to pay for. So there has to be other ways to sustain it. And we do that through drug forfeiture. And that's why it's so important. Um, so when the city of Rochester ended up with a car five years ago, where did that come from? It came from one of these bus. But I, I can't speak to Rochester, man. Or I could explain to you if, if, if we got a car. I can't. I can't speak for Rochester. I can. I can speak to if have we seized cars before? Yes, we have. Okay. Have we kept those cars? Yes, uh, not every time. But have we kept the car before from a seizure? Yes. That came as a result of a drug investigation, which again we don't target money. We target people that are selling drugs. That's what we do. We target drugs and we target people that are selling drugs. And in all honesty, the stuff that comes through that is seized validates the it validates the investigation because it shows that this is a profiteer that's selling drugs to make money. And so what do you do with that property? I'm sorry, what do you do with that property? Take the car or no, the property whatever is seized. A television set or whatever you see. Uh, we don't typically take television sets, but we do seize cars. Mm -hmm. um, the car is then seized. And it sits in an impound lot while the legal process goes through the federal government to see whether or not that car will be forfeited to us. I can also tell everybody that on a, on a frequent basis, we give things back. We give money back. We give cars back. If, it's, if in the legal <coughs> proceeding, it's not found that it was as a result, we return it. Our evidence returns cash and property all the time. Representative Jackson, thank you very much. Thank you for taking my question. Just um, out of curiosity, what is your average, say, drug bust of money, money that you would bring in? Average um, is usually very little money because you're looking at hundreds of investigations. The typical investigation, they have $40 on them because they know they need it for bail. Um, and then it ranges all the way up to um, a typical seizure, Gosh. would be a thousand or two. Um, it may be 900, it could be 2,000, it could be 3,000. They're typically in the, I would say, 1,000 to 3,000 mark is your average. Um, however, sometimes it could be as high as 100,000 or more, which is very rare. And then the majority are all in between your um, 1,000 and 10 to 15,000. I'm so sorry, but just, so if you're just getting those small, small amounts of money. How is this funding, I guess I'm lost with the math, um, is that the money that you're using to fund your program or? Yes, yes, so that, so that money again will reseize it and yeah. then it's either, it's, that, it's either sent to the state for forfeiture proceedings or the federal government. Now these days it's, it's still difficult to get that seizure in with the federal government in that system because they have to be willing to take the criminal investigation. So if they say there's no link to anything else, and, and they decide we're not going to take this investigation, it's automatically going through the state forfeiture proceedings. But then from those proceedings, if it's the state, we get 45% of what we see. And if it's the federal government, we would get 80%. That would go in a drug forfeiture fund. And we, for all operational expenses, we take from that and we, we run our drug unit. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Um, the I believe there's one more question, ma'am. Oh, I'm sorry, Representative Thompson. Thank you, Madam mm -hmm. Chair. Uh, a lot of things uh, we do as legislators are asked not to do certain things, not because they're necessarily illegal or wrong, but they give the appearance of impropriety. Doesn't a uh, police 
compartment give the perception that they, it, it, to the general public that it's possible that maybe they're arresting people just to just just to acquire their uh, their their money or doesn't this does, doesn't this send the wrong message to the general public? I don't believe it does. I would be willing to sit down with anyone here and anybody else in the community that would ever want to sit down and go through one of these investigations, I think what you would see, if you were able to sit down with me and I went through an investigation where we seized money, that we don't target money. That this bit, the investigation never started. I believe so-and-so has a lot of money because he sells drugs. It doesn't start that way. It sells, it starts, I believe so-and-so is selling drugs at this location. And so when you take a look at that, I think the public knows that. I think they see that. And we constantly work on community relations so that they understand that. And when you look at that as a whole, you'll see that they're not targeting money. They're taking money away from people that are, are profiteers as a result of selling drugs and, and selling poison to people on the street. Thank you. Ten has a question. Yes, sir. I mean, well, I guess I'm, I may be wrong, but I'm guessing you probably frequently have to send your people to other communities or forces from other communities. You can see to me nationally, even though it's the second largest city in the state, is still a relatively small town. And, uh, and just what I know about it, it seems like it's actually close to the community. So what happens when you have multiple uh, municipal police departments involved in the bus? Do they each get a piece of the drug forfeiture money, or does the lead agency get it all? Or how does that work? Nope. Each, each uh, participating agency gets a portion. And that happens all the time because there are task forces that natural police officers are on. And so whenever they're working an investigation and there's a seizure, every agency that's involved and that's usually sub telling it's usually five to ten so they all get a percentage of that that seizure if it's for yeah. it's like the world series rings everybody has <laughs> <laughs> exactly. so, thank you very much thank you very much thank appreciate it the chair recognizes ross uh Connelly from afp and eight thank you madam chair members of the committee for pulling this hearing this afternoon uh for the record my name is ross Connolly. i'm the deputy state director for Americans for Prosperity here in New Hampshire. And on behalf of the thousands of AFP activists across New Hampshire, I'd just like to urge you to support HB 1192. Uh, I, I just want to be really brief since there's been a lot of discussion and complex uh, discussion around uh, the procedure of forfeiture and some of the legal legalese. I, I believe there's another attorney that can answer some more of those questions. But just generally, uh, why this bill is important. In 2016, as has been mentioned, this legislative body decided to pass a law that said that uh, in order to have a forfeiture proceeding, we needed a conviction. You had to prove that somebody committed the crime that you're accusing them of. Uh, and, and that's a fundamental principle in New Hampshire and in the United States that you are innocent until proven guilty. And that should apply also to the assets that you have. And uh, it breeds distrust, massive distrust with the public uh, to have a, a criminal justice system that has the ability to do these things. And especially, I can't think of anything that breeds distrust more than the equitable sharing program. Uh, that is a loophole where agencies are going around the state law in order to get forfeiture proceedings without conviction. And uh, that's wrong, as U.S. legislators recognize that these are bills that are passed through the New Hampshire legislature. We should close these loopholes so that the state law is being followed and that uh, due process rights and the individual rights of granted staters are being respected and upheld. Uh, so with that, uh, I'd be happy to take any questions, but just want to be respectful of your time. Thank you very much. Are there any questions? <coughs> Dr. Walter has a question. Thank you. Would you kindly explain how the equitable sharing program is a loophole? So, uh, as has been discussed, uh, I, I, I don't want to get into the intricacies of, of forfeiture proceedings since I'm not an attorney, but uh, it's a loophole because you can, as has been mentioned, uh, if you work with the feds in a, in a seizure, you're able to still forfeit that, uh, those assets uh, up to 80% uh, can come back to the local agency without a conviction. So you can go right around state law and use this program. I'll mention that uh, former Attorney General Jeff Sessions 
because of states like New Hampshire passing these laws when he was Attorney General, uh, was encouraging states and local agencies to use these programs to do just that, go around this, their state law that passed similar legislation to New Hampshire. Again, thank you very much for being here. The chair recognizes the final witness, Henry Clementowitz. Did I do that all right? You did. Thank you uh, to the chair and to members of the committee. I have uh, some written testimony. I'd like to begin with an apology on behalf of my boss, Jean Fissonet, uh, who had really intended to um, handle this piece, but um, I had to go to a conference, uh, and <clears throat> so you're stuck with me. Uh, <clears throat> there are a couple things that I, I think it's worth emphasizing, uh, points that haven't yet been made. Um, staple to the testimony that I'm, I'm passing around are a few uh, articles from NHPR and Fosters and the union leader uh, talking about cases of simple asset forfeiture in New Hampshire. <coughs> One of which notes um, that the town of Salem Police Department hired a public relations firm and they did that with uh, drug forfeiture money. And I think that just sort of shows um, part of the problem with civil asset forfeiture. And that's, there's not really control on, on what the money can be used for. We haven't seen the kind of excesses that we've seen in other states with margarita machines, et cetera. But I don't know. I think a lot of people think, I know I think that um, the idea that the city would seize someone's property and use it to pay public relations specialists feels off to me. Um, and so I, I think there's a couple points worth, worth noting. One is that um, <coughs> forfeiture is just one of the financial components involved in a criminal proceeding. So this is enti entirely separate and unaffected would be fees and fines associated with the criminal sentence and restitution to a victim. Those are unrelated processes that also can have financial implications on a person um, above and beyond what happens with forfeiture. And I think it's important to put that in the overall context that the purpose of forfeiture isn't to punish someone, it's not to make a victim whole, it's just to take, just to take money away from a person that may be connected to illicit activity. And the second point, and sort of related, is because it's a civil proceeding, you don't have the right to an attorney at government expense when the government begins a, a civil asset forfeiture proceeding against you like you do in a criminal case. If you don't have money to hire an attorney, say because all of your money has been seized and is subject to a forfeiture petition, you're trying to do it by yourself and, and that's where some of the protections can break down. And so that's why in 2016 the legislature um, <coughs> expressed its strong preference by enacting a policy to try to tie the civil asset forfeiture program to a criminal conviction. The idea being, if we're going to take people's money, let's at least make sure that there's appropriate due process conviction protections associated with it. And I think one part of the bill, the part of the bill that um, <coughs> sections one and two, um, I view as really just finishing the job that that legislation in 2016 started. And, and saying, not only can you not forfeit someone's property if there was an acquittal, but you can't forfeit someone's property if you're not going to bring criminal charges. Um, the second part of the bill um, talks about federal equitable sharing. And <clears throat> from my perspective, the reason that this is necessary is because the legislature has expressed this policy position in saying, we shouldn't be taking people's stuff um, without appropriate due, due process protections. But of course, this legislature can't change the federal government's policies. And the, the goal behind the last part of this bill, I think, is to de-incentivize police departments and other agencies from avoiding New Hampshire state forfeiture process and the policy protections that the legislature has seen fit to put in place. And um, <clears throat> I think that's important for a number of reasons. Number one, we've We've heard some testimony about the split that happens, 80-20 versus 45-45-10. It's worth noting uh, that when a police department gets 45% of the assets from a state forfeiture proceeding, the rest of it goes to the state of New Hampshire. So it's not that it's going back to the person who seized from. That still is money flowing into the public treasury. 
it's just going to DHHS and the Attorney General's <coughs> office. Whereas it happens when it happens federally, 20% of the money stays with the federal partners. So I think on balance, from a state and local perspective, actually more of the money that's seized ends up staying in New Hampshire under the state um, under the state proceedings. Uh, and then finally, I guess I just the last piece that I think about is, as the chair had said earlier, when it's a, it's about the money, and I think. Um, Unlike restitution or fines or fees, in forfeiture, the money goes back to the police department. And so there's this tremendous financial incentive to forfeit money even if the money shouldn't be forfeited. Even if you can't make a criminal case, there's $25,000 sitting in the back of someone's trunk. And a police officer might look at that and say, you know, the computers at our office, at our offsite aren't working. We need new undercover phones. We should forfeit this money. And I think it does um, lead to a breakdown in community relations because people think, rightly or wrongly, that police departments are incentivized to take their money um, rather than just seeking justice. And I, I think that's a problem, and I think that's why it's so important to tie where this financial incentive exists for the local law enforcement to tie these proceedings to those with the levels of due process that we're accustomed to. So, I'd be happy to take any questions if there are any. I should have said uh, I'm here on behalf of the ACLU of New Hampshire, a nonpartisan, nonprofit organization dedicated to advancing civil rights in the place. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, Madam Chair. So, um, the, the officer from the Nashua Police Department testified that the investigations aren't initiated based on the money, but they're initiated based on this is where the drugs are at. Are you aware or have any evidence of a behavior shift on their part um, since uh, the 2016 law passed where oh, they're actually starting to bring in the federal government more because they're actually looking to go after assets or are you not aware of anything like that? Um, so I'm not aware of how the National Police Department's um, policies on forfeitures have shifted since 2016. Um, but part of that's due to the fact that the Attorney General's office has, has viewed, and there's um, a newspaper article to this effect of my testimony, <coughs> has viewed the 2016 uh, legislation as not requiring the pendency of a criminal case, and so it's not as robust as I think it might have been intended, so it might not have had the effect it was intended for. Okay. Thank you, Madam Chair. More broadly speaking, are, are you aware of a larger Increase a federal presence in general then since since this past. I'm not I'm not aware of a larger federal presence and and part of that um, is because um, sometimes there's purely state agencies or the the federal government doesn't necessarily need to be involved at um, I mean there's just not as many federal agents in New Hampshire as there are local law enforcement officers of course. Um, but they don't need to be involved at the outset when the money is found in order to get involved with the equitable sharing. So um, it could be that a case starts in Nashua, then it just goes up to the feds after they seize the money. All right, thank you. Any other questions? Uh, if not, is there anyone else here who wants to testify? Now I close the hearing and um, open the hearing on House Bill 1685. Thank you all for being here.